Welcome to our webinar, Dry Eye Solutions for Glaucoma Patients. My name is Brezette Castellanos, and I am the Social Media and Outreach Manager at Glaucoma Research Foundation. If you would like to turn on the closed captions for this webinar, click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Joining us today is Dr. Ruth Williams. Dr. Williams has been a glaucoma specialist at the Witten Eye Clinic in Chicago since 1991. We also have the privilege of having her as the vice chair of our board of directors. After receiving her medical degree from Rush Medical College in Chicago, Dr. Williams completed her residency in ophthalmology at the California Pacific Medical Center and a fellowship in glaucoma at the University of California in San Francisco. Ruth has been recognized with numerous awards, but her most distinguishable trait is her compassion towards her patients. Please welcome Dr. Ruth Williams. Thank you, Brizette. I'm so happy to be here today with you and with all the participants. Many of you have glaucoma and many or a family member of, or friend with glaucoma and um, I'm glad we're together to talk about dry eye and glaucoma. This is a picture of a patient with dry eye disease just before I checked her intraocular pressure. When we put the fluorescein in the eye to um, get the, the eye pressure, I almost always take a look at the tear film. And I've learned a lot over the years of looking at the tear film over and over again. This particular patient um, has a lot of dye uptake in the epithelium, which is a little denuded. And I describe this to my patients as it looks like someone threw a handful of sand at your eye. And often that's what it'll feel like to the patient as well. So one thing I like to say to my colleagues, if we're talking about dry eye and glaucoma, I say, oh, everybody with glaucoma has dry eye syndrome. And that, that's actually not quite the truth. But if we look at the data, if you look at multiple studies that look at the percentage of dry eye in the general population, it runs between about 5% and 50% of people have dry eye syndrome. Whereas if you look at a population of glaucoma patients, the, the various studies quote between about 40% and 75%. And so you can see that dry eye is much more common in our glaucoma patients. So the question is, why is that? And there are several factors that contribute to that. And one is that the prevalence of glaucoma increases with age. So glaucoma is an age-related disease, which means that it's more common in people as we get older. And the second part of that is that it's also a chronic disease. So glaucoma tends to get worse as, or it tends, can sometimes get worse or be more of a challenge as we age. And the same is true of dry eye disease, that it's more common in people as they age and it's a chronic disease. So it may get more challenging to treat over time. And what's interesting about both glaucoma and dry eye disease is that we want to treat them effectively early, as early on in the disease process as possible. So aggressively treating glaucoma early and dry eye disease early makes them less troublesome diseases later. But the really interesting thing about these two diseases which are intertwined is that the treatment of glaucoma often makes dry eye disease worse. So it's very challenging and we have to work on the two uh, in tandem. This is another photo uh, taken just before a pressure check. And you can see here that there's not all that dye uptake and yet the tear film isn't nice and smooth like we want it to be. And, and in this picture, you can see that the tear film is a little irregular and we call this a decreased tear breakup time, meaning that you have a right after you blink, you have a nice smooth tear film, but that very quickly that tear film breaks down. And this patient might not complain that it feels like sand was in my eye, but this patient might complain that, you know, doc, my eyes just feel tired all the time. Or 
when I start reading, I can read for a while, but after a time, I just get so fatigued. And that's because the tear film um, isn't as, as dense and lovely and you get these little dry spots. Another common complaint from my patients with dry eye is that um, my, my vision fluctuates so much. So when someone says, you know, sometimes my vision's crystal clear and other times I just feel like I can't see, I often, that's a, that's a clue that a patient might have dry eye syndrome. Another uh, very common complaint is that um, the vision's blurry and I'll ask, well, if you blink, does it clear up? And if the patient says, yeah, when I blink, 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 the vision clears up, then that's almost always a sign of an ocular surface problem and not something inside the eye, which actually makes me very happy because it's, it's a problem or pathology on the surface that we can address and isn't a problem with the back of the eye, say in the macula or the retina. Why do we care about dry eye syndrome? Why is it a problem? And I really see three issues. And the first one is a quality of life issue. So if your eyes are fatigued or tired or you can't see, um, it, it, it's really about a quality of life and how you're experiencing life. You know, the more I think about what my job as a physician is, I think that more than anything else, it's about improving the quality of life of my patients. And it, people who, who have a really healthy tear film don't ever think about their eyes. People with good vision, a healthy tear film, it, it's never something that enters your mind. So once you start having problems with dry eye, people start noticing it and thinking about it and feeling tired and having trouble reading and all the things we just talked about. But the other thing that happens is that if the eyes are dry, it can make using eye drops more uncomfortable. And so either consciously or subconsciously, um, a patient might be less motivated to use eye drops if they're really uncomfortable. And when, you know, a drug I use a lot is uh, dorzolamide timolol. It's a great glaucoma drug. And, but dorzolamide has a little bit of a lower pH to keep it in solution. And so patients who take that drop are particularly sensitive to dryness because it'll make a drug that stings normally sting even a little more. And then dry eye can affect surgical outcomes. So there are certain surgical procedures that dryness can make more complicated. And in the way that these diseases are intertwined, Surgery can also make dry eye a little more, um, uh, can make it worse too. So they all have to be addressed together. So just because nothing is easy or straightforward, dry eye disease isn't one disease. And actually, as most of you know, glaucoma isn't one disease either, but a collection of diseases. And dry eye is a collection of diseases and actually interplay with some other problems. And this first picture is of the meibomian glands, which are the, the glands that are along the eyelid margin, just at the base of the eyelashes. And they can sometimes get inflamed and have a turbid kind of yellowy discharge, or in this case, that picture you see here, kind of a thick whitish discharge. And that inflammation can exacerbate dry eye syndrome and make it worse. So, so sometimes your doctor will talk about treating your meibomian gland disease in concert with talking about treating the dry eye disease. Or in the second picture, the crossing that you see is blepharitis, which is another eyelid ocular surface problem that can make dry eye disease worse. So we end up talking about sometimes your doctor Doctors will talk about it interchangeably, dry eye disease, blepharitis, meibomian gland disease, sometimes we call it meibomitis, but all of those things together, we call ocular surface disease. And so anything that affects the ocular surface also affects your treatment of glaucoma. And we, you know, doctors like to use fancy words um, and the word we use for this words we use for this is comorbidities. So these are two or sometimes more different 
chronic diseases that interplay off of one another and the treatments are intertwined. So let's talk a little bit about management, about what are we gonna do about these problems? If you look at this picture here, you can see that this person has a combination of that, that punctate staining, that sand in the eye look, and a disrupted tear film. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about treating the dryness, and then we'll talk a little bit about how to treat glaucoma to minimize the effect on the tear surface. So we all know about artificial tears, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I call the thin, the medium, and the thick. So the thin artificial tears are the ones that you drop in and your doctor tells you to use them, um, we might say four times a day, or if you're really having a lot of dryness, we might say more often, but it comes out in a drop and it doesn't blur the vision very much, but it also doesn't coat the surface as well as say a medium artificial tear, which is a gel former. So the gel formers come out in a drop and then when it hits the ocular surface, it thickens up into a thicker gel. And the reason we don't go straight to a thicker drop right away is that it can also blur the vision a little bit. And then the gels are even thicker than that. And I often have my patients use the gels at night because it does blur the vision. I, I like gels so much, the thick, that I use an artificial tear gel in the, between the lens and the eye when I'm doing laser treatments. And so the patients leave the laser with this really nicely treated ocular surface and often feel great, even though I've just done a laser treatment. Oftentimes we'll want our patients to use preservative free artificial tears. And we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, preservative free glaucoma drops as well. But in order to put a drop in a bottle and keep it safe from contamination, we add all kinds of preservatives. And so the preservative free artificial tears come in these little single dose vials that are more gentle on the eye. Um, there are some new artificial tears just coming out that have micropore filters. So they can be preservative free, but still in a bottle. And I think we'll be seeing more of those products. And then some of you use albumin tears, which is a really cool artificial, uh, uh, well, uh, dry eye treatment. I don't do this myself. Once a patient gets to this level of needing care, uh, I usually involve a cornea specialist as well. So your glaucoma specialist may or may not use albumin tears, but uh, a lot of cornea specialists do. And what, what we do is we actually take blood out of the patient and centrifuge it down. So you get to the, the kind of thick, lovely albumin that has, you know, healing proteins and anti-inflammatory factors and all the, the great things that we have in our bloodstream, but it becomes an artificial tear or a tear supplement that coats the eye. And um, I have quite a few patients who have been helped by that. And then we can talk about some of the other things that we use eye drops. There are the anti-inflammatory drops, sequa, zeadra, restasis. I tend not to use a lot of those myself. And the reason is I don't, we have really good studies that show that it's a lot harder to use your eye drops if you're on multiple drops. And if I want to prioritize pressure control, I may be hesitant add another drug to the treatment regimen because I don't want to complicate your, your treatment regimen too much. And I also don't want to give you too many co-pays and make it really expensive. That being said, because dry eye treatment is something that we want to treat early on in the course of the disease and really back down that disease process, these drugs can be very, very helpful early on, early on in the, in the treatment uh, protocol. So we may want to, um, in certain cases, push for uh, treatments that minimize glaucoma drops, which we'll get to, 
and then put people on these drugs. So you may or may not be on them, but uh, they can be very helpful. And then sometimes we give a short course of steroid treatment to help with the inflammation. One of the things I really like is using punctal plugs. And you can see in this picture, this is a collagen punctal plug that goes into that little opening in the eyelid. There's an opening in each of the four eyelids that drains the tears out. So in some patients, it can be helpful to clog up that opening. There are, are the collagen dissolvable plugs, which I personally like because they're so safe and easy to use. And I can pop them in the lower lids. And if it helps, I might pop them in the upper lids. But one of the reasons they're safe is because they're dissolvable and they don't last forever. Um, they last typically up to six months. Um, but they're down all the way in the punctum in the lack in the in the tube there. And so patients don't feel them at all or see them. I practice in Chicago, so I tend to use these more in the winter when the car heaters are on and all our heaters in our house are on and the, we're indoors all the time in dry environments. And so they often will help my patients through the winter months, unless of course you are a snowbird and go to Florida where it's humid and lovely and dry eye is often better. Some of the cornea specialists in my practice also use silicone plugs, which are more permanent. I, I used to do that, but I tend not to now because sometimes they can come out or cause a little irritation, but some of you might have, um, some of you might have the silicone more permanent plugs. Then there are some really innovative new kinds of treatments for dry eye, which stimulate tearing. One of them is a nose spray called Tervava. And then I forgot to put in here, but there's also the uh, True Tear. It's a neurostimulator that you can put up your nose and give a little shock and it causes a little bit of tearing. So um, there are lots of new ideas about how to stimulate tear production. And I just want to remind everybody that not, dry eye isn't just one disease. It's lots of different issues. So your physician may recommend one of these treatments, but not the other, depending on what he or she thinks the issue is. And then the, the, the other treatments that I have here in the, in, the lighter, um, in the lighter gray color are all things that we use to treat the diseases I talked about before that contribute to dry eye, um, the meibomian gland disease and the blepharitis. So for example, your doctor may ask you to use warm compresses or a brooder mask to help warm up that oil in the oil glands and get it cleaned out. I really like cleaning the lids every day and do it myself with, um, there are a bunch of different products and I'm only mentioning a few of them here. Um, there are sprays that you can use or pads like Ocusoft or Evisia. There's a bunch of others as well. Avanova um, is a product that can be used. Oftentimes I'll put my patients on a dose, uh, a, a 30 to 60 day uh, dose uh, course of low dose doxycycline. And what that does is it helps improve the functioning of the meibomian glands and it can really help clear up the, the lids, especially if you've had meibomian gland disease for a long time. And then there are a bunch of other treatments, which I'm just listing here, but won't go into detail, but some of you may have these recommended by your doctor, which would include uh, Lipiflow, which expresses some of the meibomian gland stuff. Glafax, New Lids, Ilux, and Tear Care are all options, as is the IPL laser that some people use for treating ocular surface disease. So let's shift our conversation to talking about how we treat the glaucoma with an eye to minimizing dry eye disease. So one of the most important things you want to do is reduce the BAK. What's BAK? It's benzalkonium chloride, and it's the preservative that is most popular in eye drops and is probably the biggest contributor to dry eye syndrome. And in fact, one of the drugs I use the most has the highest concentration of BAK, and that's generic latanoprost. So there are many 
branded glaucoma drops that have other preservatives in them. But my all time favorite is using preservative free, completely preservative free glaucoma medications. And all of a sudden, as of this year, there are a whole bunch of new choices in preservative free glaucoma medications. And they come in these single dose vials. And so you twist off the cap, put a drop, drop, and throw the plastic away. And so there's no preservative uh, in, in that medication. It's very, very safe. And, and um, it minimizes the assault to your tear film. I'll, I'll just put a side parentheses. However, those of you who are um, really interested in decreasing plastic and waste, this is not my favorite part of this treatment, but we have to prioritize you know, what we're doing right now. And so for me, taking care of your ocular surface trumps the uh, plastic waste. But what I'd really love to see is uh, products that uh, don't have plastic waste. The other thing I'm very, very aggressive with my patients is to minimize the number of drops. The less chemical I'm putting on the surface of your eye, the better your tear foam is gonna be. So I, I like to give you the very least that we can. And there are different ways to do that. Um, but one of the ways are what's called fixed combination. So there's more than one drug in one bottle. The, the other reasons to do that is you're more likely to take your medicines. If I don't have you on a lot of medicine and uh, you'll have fewer, fewer copays. So it's less expensive. Usually the whole glaucoma community has moved toward earlier laser selective laser trabeculoplasty. There's some compelling evidence for even starting in early treatment of glaucoma with laser instead of drops. Although your, your doctor may recommend SLT as a primary treatment, the first treatment or uh, the SLT. But I certainly use laser earlier in the course of disease than we used to, either first or sometimes second or third, but very early in, in the course of the disease. And, and um, SLT is so safe and usually effective and I think an extraordinary treatment. And I would use SLT to try to minimize drops either first or second, but as a mechanism for keeping you off of extra drops. Darista is a little pellet of uh, a drug that's a prostaglandin analog that's bioerodible. And what that means is you inject it into the eye and it it erodes over time and elutes very small amounts of glaucoma medication. We talk a lot about bioerodibles and things that we can inject in the eye to um, elute medicine over time so that people aren't using drops. And this is the first one we have FDA approved. And I think it's so exciting because it's the future of how we're gonna take care of glaucoma, I think. So we'll get more and more of these choices available over time. And then there's the minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And I listed a bunch of them. I'm not gonna go over them. Some of you have had um, MIGS and each of these has a different approach and there are webinars on each of these. So I'm not gonna go over them, but. Just to say the principle is that glaucoma surgery is getting easier and safer. Well, I don't like to use the word easy because surgery is never easy, but it's getting safer and with fewer complications. And so we may be operating earlier in the process and hopefully getting you off of glaucoma medications. And a perfect time to do so is if you're having cataract surgery to combine it with a mixed procedure and try to get you off of a drop or two, or maybe even if we really um, are effective, get you off of drops completely. When I was in training a long time ago, we didn't have that many choices for how to treat glaucoma. And we didn't have that many choices for how to treat dry eye syndrome. And so we had algorithms of you know, first you do this, then you do this, then you do that. But both dry eye and glaucoma are such complex diseases that uh, play off of one another. 
And we have so many choices for treating each of the disease. So I now think of our treatment as like a palette of choices. So your, you and your physician together will make some goals. You know, what's our target pressure? How many drops do you want to be on? How expensive is this? What, what are your long-term goals? How do we keep you seeing until you're 104? Those are all the kind of questions that we should have together and make goals. And then we'll go to our choices and put together a treatment plan that is tailored just to you. And another reason we need lots of choices is that we don't cure dry eye yet. We don't cure glaucoma yet. And so we are not going to get rid of your problem, but we're going to help you manage it. And so we'll do that together um, with different choices. So if, if what, what one person get treatment choices um, and the things that are tried will be different than another person. And we may try multiple things until we land on what works best. One thing I think that's really important to understand or to talk about is our community of ophthalmologists together. When you come in the room, you are one patient and you get our full attention and our full care. But behind the scenes, we're talking and thinking and gathering evidence and trying new procedures and working as a community to come up with solutions that work better for our patients. And I love the conversations that go on at our meetings. And it's not just the physicians, it's industry is working to come up with solutions for glaucoma. And then Glaucoma Research Foundation and other organizations who are working so hard to fuel the future of glaucoma care. But I gotta say, I'm probably most inspired by my patients. You are dealing with a serious, well, sometimes several serious eye diseases that are chronic and progressive. And you bring to us stories of gratitude and overcoming. And I really, it really is rather remarkable to me. And I love participating with you in your care and your doctor does too. And in closing, I want to share something I've been thinking about actually just for about 24 hours. And that is the difference between optimism and hope. When I was a young physician, I had so much optimism, which I think is kind of thinking, oh, here's my patient. I can fix their problem. I can do this. I can do that. And yet after over 30 years of glaucoma practice, I have so much I, I think I've been sobered by the, the disease of glaucoma and dry eye, but especially glaucoma, because it isn't something we cure and get rid of. Again, I'll say at least not yet. It's something that we, it presents challenges to us and we have to keep going. But hope is something that allows us to tackle our problems together. And it gives us inspiration for the future of what we're gonna do. And Glaucoma Research Foundation is so much part of that because they have this vision for vision restoration and curing glaucoma and strategies for going for that vision. And I think together we can have hope that your disease and your story is one that'll be okay. And that it might not go perfectly. And you might even have a complication from a surgery or a drop that didn't work or dry eye that's getting worse and driving you crazy. But together we'll tackle those problems and find a solution that gives you the quality of life. And when you have quality of life, then we can enjoy it and be inspired and embrace the day that we have this very day. So thank you. And Brazette, I'll turn it back over to you for Q&A.
Thank you, Ruth. That was amazing. And thank you to everyone who has submitted their questions. I would like to start off this discussion with the following question. What are some of the most common symptoms of dry eyes? You know, it varies from no symptoms. So sometimes people can have pretty uh, dramatic findings at the slit lamp and I'm really concerned and the patient has no symptoms. And by the way, parentheses, that's a little bit like glaucoma. Sometimes I can be extremely concerned about someone's optic nerve and they, they, you know, the patient might not be experiencing the glaucoma yet. So it can go from no symptoms at all to, as I described, fluctuating vision, fatigue, um, being able to blink it back into place and that sandy dry feeling, which I think is probably the most troublesome of all of them when your eyes just feel sandy and dry all the time to patients who have really severe disease. And um, it's really just a chronic pain that they endure all the time. So there's, there's a full range of the experience. Thank you. Are there any natural solutions to dry eyes? For example, supplements, um, maki berry, uh, zeaxanthin. Yeah. So we actually have some evidence, uh, evidence base, which of course is a little challenging because everybody's story is different, but, uh, we have often recommended omega threes. Uh, there was actually a study, a really big dry eye study and shockingly the omega three treatment group didn't do any better than the others, but some of us really think it does help, uh, a diet. I think diet is, is enormous. I think I think our diets are very important. So a Mediterranean diet is the best. Um, um, a lot of people, a lot of people who are expertise, experts in diet and the eye will tell you that you should have fish a couple times a week. Um, but I think the most important thing is uh, diet high in fruits and vegetables. And I, I, there's also good uh, data around neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's, macular degeneration and cataracts that it matters. So I'm a huge proponent of switching to a more plant-based diet. Um, what are some of the names of the newest preservative free drops, if you know of any? Well, so the, the ones that we had available, well, there was Ocudose, which was Timolol, and then there was Zyoptin, which um, is a, a drop um, that's preservative-free, and then COSOP PF, preservative-free. Those, uh, the Zyoptin has a generic alternative now. Uh, the COSOP PF has a generic alternative and Latanoprast has a preservative free alternative now. And some of that's new since January. So my patients are just starting to be able to get it in the pharmacy. And you mentioned some gels. Are there preservative free forms of those gels? Oh, I don't know the answer to that. There might be the gels that I use aren't preservative free, but I'd actually have to ask a cornea specialist that question. Alrighty, we'll get back to you guys on that. Um, you mentioned some drops. Um, are any of those over the counter? And how would you rank their effectiveness? So the artificial tears are all over the counter. What I tell my patients is, go buy a bunch of them. I talked about the, the thin, the medium and the thick, go buy an assortment of them and try them. So what a lot of my patients find is that in the morning, they might want to use one thing in the afternoon, something else, but what's most effective is what works for you. So what relieves your symptoms, what helps you um, see better. And one thing I, I have to say, anytime you have a lot of treatments, you don't have one really good one. So I would say experiment with it, try it. There's not one that's the best. So that means that they can use them as often as they'd like, or is there a limitation to how many drops they can use daily? So the only risk to using artificial tears um, all the time are the ones that have preservative in it. So if so I tell my patients, use your artificial tears all the time. In fact, you should be using them way more than you use them. But if, if you're really going to use them a lot, I would encourage you to try a, a preservative-free formula, formulation. Thank you. Do you recommend your patients use the nanodropper to reduce drop 
volume and therefore possibly reduce the side effects from glaucoma drops? Yeah, so the nanodropper is really um, interesting um, device that you can buy and put it on your on your bottle. And one of the things, you know, patients often say, oh, do you think I'm getting enough of my drop in? And I always say, yes, you are, because the drop size is much bigger than you need to get maximum absorption of your drug. So even if you get a portion of your eye drop in, it's fine. But what nanodropper does is it decreases the drop size so that the bottle lasts longer. And what I think the person asking the question is suggesting is, you know, maybe you're just getting less chemical and less preservative in the eye with nanodropper. Great. You know, it, it's, it's a great tool. Amazing. Um, what is the most effective regimen when it comes to using artificial tears and glaucoma drops? Um, should you lubricate before the glaucoma drop or after? Yeah, so I, especially if patients are saying, oh, my drosolomycetimol stinks so much when I put it in, it makes me not want to use my drop. I'll say use an artificial tear, but do it, you know, three, four minutes before because you don't want to wash them out. But if you put an artificial tear, let it absorb and then put your drop in, it can be a lot more comfortable. Um, but my only the only thing that I say is make sure you have enough time between drops that you're not, one's not washing the other out, but it doesn't have to be very long. Good to know. Um, another question we have here is, can eye surgery cause or increase dry eye? Absolutely. So um, we didn't talk uh, today about, for example, a trabeculectomy or even a tube. So those have an external blab or an external um, reservoir that changes the shape of the upper eyelid. And so, for example, when the eyelid, I'm going to put my hand up, when the eyelid is coming over the blab, you know, it comes up and over the blab and might not, um, you know, come down over the, the cornea effectively. So that can cause dry eye or exacerbate dry eye. But any kind of surgery, because you're cutting into the surface of the eye, can make dry eye worse. So if you have uh, serious dry eye disease and need surgery, it shouldn't stop you from doing it. But just talk to your doctor in that perioperative period about what you need to do to uh, support the dry eye. It's no. What about screen time? Can screen time affect dry eye? One of the problems with screen time is that, especially if we're being very intense, is that we might not have as much blink. And so, yes, screen time can, um, can, make, can increase dry eye symptoms and findings. A couple things. I often tell my patients, take a break from your screen look outside at a distance, take a break, relax a little bit. Um, the other thing is, especially if people tell me, oh, I'm blurring when I'm on Zoom for a long time. Stop, put in an artificial tear, close your eyes. Um, but I've learned a long time ago not to tell people to limit their screen time because nobody does. <laughs> um, and lack of sleep also contribute to dry eye. Lack of sleep? Oh, yeah. I. So I talked about diet. I think diet's very important. Diet, not smoking, getting regular sleep is really, really important. Definitely. Your eyes are resting, they're rejuvenating, and uh, it's, it's just contributing to your overall health. For someone who has tried um, a lot of the usual treatments for dry eye, but haven't found a solution, what do you recommend for that person? a cornea specialist. <laughs> that's what I do. You know, I talked about the albumin tears. That's a level of care for dry eye that's beyond my expertise. And so we have people who are, we call them cornea and external disease specialists, and they're amazing and, and can come alongside the glaucoma specialist or the general ophthalmologist to give extra support and maybe some suggestions that we might think of. I will say that I never refer somebody without doing the low hanging fruit first. For example, the first thing a cornea specialist is gonna tell me every single time is put them on preservative free drugs. So I don't even send you until I've done that. 
Um, but once we do the basic things and you're still really frustrated, um, we, we need another specialist to help us with this. By the way, that's what I love about ophthalmology is that we have all these subspecialists. And so we have people with incredible expertise and we can work as, as a team. Awesome. So this is something that a patient can bring up to their glaucoma specialist. Definitely. If you're feeling frustrated um, and you've tried a bunch of things, most of us are very happy to bring in someone else uh, as part of the team. We don't take care of chronic disease all by ourselves. We do it as a team. And so you mentioned that some people who have dry eye might not know it. What can happen if dry eye is left untreated? So dry eye can become chronic disease. So I showed you that first picture, you know, where the epithelium was breaking down. You don't want to let the disease get that far. So sometimes there are underlying chronic inflammation if the eyelids are inflamed. Um, so if, if your physician says, you know, you have some symptoms of dry eye, um, it's important to treat early. And as I mentioned, some, it, it depends what's causing it. So I don't want to get too much into treatment, but it's very much like glaucoma in that we want to treat it early. It's easier to take care of if we tackle it early. Awesome. Um, there's a question here about mineral oil artificial tears. Are you familiar with those? Yeah, yes, I am. So again, um, so there are artificial tears that have more of an oily base to them. And it depends a little bit on what's causing it. I didn't get into all the complexities of dry eye. So there are three layers of the tear film. And you, depending on which layer has the pathology, different kinds of uh, artificial tears may be um, more helpful for you. So it's something your doctor can help you with, or you can experiment with on your own and see which ones help the most. Got it. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the pulse light laser and its effectiveness? Yeah. So IPL um, is a treatment for the eyelids that have chronic inflammation or meibomian gland disease. And not everybody offers it, but it can be very helpful in clearing up those eyelid inflammation, which secondarily affects the dry eye. So IPL can be very helpful. And when someone has that at that point, they are experiencing symptoms or is this something that would be brought up to their attention by their ophthalmologist? I think it depends a little bit on what the ophthalmologist thinks is causing the problem. I think most of us would try simpler things first. Um, I think most of us would try, you know, lid scrubs or um, the lid sprays or the pads. I really like the pads. Um, warm compresses, artificial tears, most of us would start there first. But if that's not tackling the problem, then we might talk about things that are procedures and, you know, take more time and effort and are more expensive. One thing that came to mind, as you were mentioning the pads is makeup. Women wear mascara. Um, do you think that can have an adverse effect on those glands? So, um, my patients ask me about makeup all the time and I say, wear the makeup. Um, <laughs> gosh, you need it. As we get older, we need a little makeup. So wear it, get a little color on there. But I do advocate cleaning your face really well at night. And what I recommend is that people do, you know, general cleansing. And then after you've cleaned the makeup off, take, you know, one of those pads an Invisia pad or an Octosoft pad or Sterilate or whatever you have, uh, there are many other brands too, and use that to clean the eyelids um, when you're done. You want to go to bed with your eyelids all clean and nothing there causing inflammation while you sleep. Got it. Thank you. Is PRP the same as Albin, Albin in eye drops? Um, P a PRP, I'm not sure what that really, uh, can you tell me the, the um, PRP, yes, I think um, it relates to what you mentioned that is extracted from the blood mm -hmm. and then put back into the eye. Yeah, there are several different products. And again, I, you know, I don't personally do that, but uh, we have um, in our practice, we have 
quite a few glaucoma specialists and they manage that and recommend it. And each doctor has a different, um, uh, a different favorite. So um, I don't know all the nuances of it. I just think it's, in, it's incredibly helpful for severe uh, uh, dry eye disease. And I have quite a few patients who do use it. It's a lot of trouble because you have to go and, you know, get your blood drawn and, um, um, you know, there's effort involved, but if you have chronic pain and your eyes are bothering you every day, it's worth it. And PRP is palate rich plasma. That's the, okay. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> no problem. I wasn't sure either. Um, so if you do have severe dry eye, is it possible to reverse some of the damage or is it something that once it's there? It's yeah, good? well, it depends what the damage is, but yes, absolutely. For example, the epithelium on the eye, that front um, layer is like your skin in that it's constantly regenerating and it regenerates less robustly as we get old. So we want to protect it. But yes, it, that, all that staining that you saw on that first slide, that can be regenerated and um, get to be a healthier, uh, a, a healthier look. There's hope. <laughs> There's so much hope. <laughs> um, so you mentioned blinking as a way to, you know, help irritation when looking at a screen. Are there any other eye exercises that can help? Well, I, I think the opposite of exercises, um, taking a break. So um, after you've been on for a little, and this goes for reading too. I have my patients take reading breaks because uh, a, a lot of my older patients are frustrated because they love reading so much and they can't sit down and read like they used to. So I, I say, do it in short spurts, sit down, you know, be on your screen or read for, you know, 20 minutes and then stop, look outside, rest your eyes, put an artificial tear in, blink, 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 and then come back. I think also I mentioned, you know, the intensity, uh, if you stop and rest, you're, you're taking a break from the intensity of it. Definitely in moderation always. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have a question here about heated and electric iPads. Um, are they good for you? Do they help dry eye? And if so, how long should patients leave them on? So there are a number of different ways to do heat treatments to the eye, but the principle is, is that you're heating up those meibomian glands and helping uh, get that oil going through and cleaning out. And um, the old fashioned way, and a lot of my patients still really like doing this, is just a hot compress. So you run a washcloth under hot water. I always say just hot enough so you're not burning yourself. Wring it out, fold it up and put it a uh, on your eyes until it cools down, but you want it to be pretty warm. And I encourage my patients to use this as a, you know, form of meditation. We're all told we're supposed to meditate, which I'm terrible at, but if you can lie there and rest with your warm compress, but you're right, there are a bunch of different products. A lot of them are available online. Uh, there's the Bruder mask, there's, you know, the electric ones, there's all kinds of different products and they're all okay. As long as you don't, you know, get them too hot and hurt yourself. And, um, you know, I would think about using them about as long as it would take for a washcloth to cool down. So, you know, five minutes. Amazing. You mentioned the Mediterranean diet. Are there any foods that we know will exacerbate the effects of dry eye? Oh, that's a great question. So, you know, that there's a lot of talk about the, the anti-inflammatory diets, by the way, I am not a food and diet expert, so I don't know all that data really well, but, um, I think if I were struggling with severe dry eye, I might at least experiment with an anti-inflammatory diet. And, you know, you can Google that and look it up, but, uh, I don't really know the data. I do know the data though, about increasing our fruits and vegetables and some people claim um, fish as well um, and how that affects a lot of our neuro neurodegenerative types of diseases and um, I the more I read about it the more I think about it the more I believe in it diet is very important um, there's another question here about floaters and they want to know if that is related to dry eye I hate floaters <laughs> um, I get asked about floaters a hundred times a day. Well, not a hundred, but 
you know, many times. <laughs> yeah, it feels like a hundred. Uh, uh, you know, floaters are, you know, uh, the bane of our existence, um, but not related to dry eye. So floaters are in the vitreous. And they pop out when we, uh, particularly under certain lighting conditions, when we look at a white wall or a white page and, or the blue sky. And some of you um, probably are super frustrated by yours, but not it's not caused by dry eye. Awesome. So our last question here is, um, will my dry eye get worse as my glaucoma progresses? Not necessarily. So dry eye is a related and intertwined chronic progressive disease, just as glaucoma, but you know, it, it, diseases are unpredictable, which is why you have to come and see us, you know, depend, we give you, you know, some of you come every three months, some of you come every four, some of you come once a year, but we can't predict how quickly a disease is going to get worse over time. So that's why we watch you. And so dry eye can be the one that ends up being more of a problem or the glaucoma might, but um, they're not necessarily going to get worse together, but what they impact one another. And so we, we treat them together and, you know, it's, a, it's a collaboration of treatment. We got one more question. I feel like it's worth answering. So okay. This will be our last one, I promise. Um, Dr. Ruth, can you describe ocular redness? Um, and is it due to glaucoma drops? Why does this happen and what to do? Oh, redness. It, you know, it's, it's a non-specific kind of issue. So inflammation can cause it. Definitely your eye drops can cause it. Um, dry eye can cause it. All kinds of things can cause red eye. And sometimes I'm going to tell my patients, you know, you're just going to have to accept a little bit of red eye as part of your, you know, necessary. Um, other times we'll work really, really hard to get rid of it. There is an over-the-counter uh, drop. It's actually dilute glaucoma medicine. It's dilute bromonidine that will take some of the red out temporarily. You shouldn't use it every day, but if you're going out for the evening and you really want that crisp white look, you can use a little bit of Lumify in the evening, but, uh, or in the day, but um, um, redness isn't specific to glaucoma or specific to dry eye. I'm actually familiar with that eye drop. It's um, kind of big in the makeup community, believe it or right. not. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's by BNL, right? Bal and Loam, Lumify. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you so much for making time to be with us today. We hope that all of you have learned some helpful tips to manage your dry eye. Thank you, Brazette. It was great talking with you. Thank you, Ruth. Before we leave, I want to let you know that we have our fifth Glaucoma Patient Summit coming up on June 23rd and 24th in Long Beach, California. For more information on that, please visit our website at www.glaucoma.org slash summit. We have an amazing program planned for you, so please join us and register today. Thank you once again for being here with us and for joining us in our bold vision of a future free from glaucoma. Because of you, the cure is truly insight.